When I was 23, I used to run the youth theatre at local Theatre Royale. It was an old, old building, from the Georgian period at least, Baroque, 1700s, etc. It was beautiful. Dark green and red with great facades and that lovely musty theatre smell. I could spend all my time there, happily. But I hated being there alone, which I often was, to prepare shows or to set up my session. There's a lot of prep that goes into a show. I had a key, so I could let myself in. And if no one could meet me, I would have to do this alone. It would take me a lot of courage to go alone, I can tell you that. Anyway, the foyer was fine. It was renovated and new and fresh, and nothing ever happened in there. It felt welcoming and modern. Upstairs in the old bar was a bit different, but nothing too bad. This was on the first floor, second if you're American. I still didn't like being in the old bar alone, but thankfully it was only used for meetings, so I rarely was. The third floor, forget about it. This was where the tech room was kept, a small two-person room that was permanently boiling hot from the equipment, except when it wasn't. This room had been the tech room since the age of literal gas spotlights, and Jeff, the tech manager, was certain the gaslight technician enjoyed his job so much that he never left. He would often be up there, apparently, in the boiling hot tech room, and it would suddenly turn as cold as a freezer. Tech would malfunction and crew members would laugh it off and blame old equipment and damp. Jeff and I knew better. In front of the tech room was the raked balcony of chairs, and one of them was permanently kept down. This chair, right in front of where Jeff looked out to see the stage whilst doing his job during a show, was reserved for Abigail. It was taken as read that if that chair was ever up, Abigail would mess with the theatre. Even the cleaners left that chair down, and it permanently had a reserved sign taped to it. Someone once said a theatre is not a theatre without ghosts. I don't know what it is about them. Perhaps the intense range of emotions actors have to portray and audiences feel create a spiritual vacuum. Almost every theatre has at least one ghost. Theatre Royal had at least three and not all of them were as friendly as Abigail. So when going around and setting up, I had to walk through the auditorium to get to the dressing rooms and the rehearsal rooms, etc. Even with all the lights on, it was always just dim and cold. I always had an overwhelming feeling when walking through the backstage area that I shouldn't turn around and look up to the balcony. Abigail was waiting. I would sing loudly to keep myself calm. All the show tunes I could think of. I'm not a great singer, thanks to larynx polyps, but it was enough to keep me calm. I was usually so lost in my to-do list that I could fight the overwhelming urge to look up at that seat. Then, one day whilst painting the flats for our production of Wizard of Oz, I suddenly forgot all the words to Defying Gravity, my go-to song for keeping calm. Before I knew what was happening, I had turned around and looked up at the balcony because I felt compelled to. I couldn't fight it anymore. It was like Abigail was calling to me. And there, unsurprisingly, was a woman in Victorian garb sitting patiently in the top right of the balcony on the seat that was always kept down for her. She didn't do or say anything. She didn't move. And I nervously smiled at her and went back to my painting. She wasn't a threat, and she was clearly watching me being the old stage to life. Our youth theatre productions were always anticipated due to their brightness. Abigail seemed to think so. She liked my singing, according to the theatre managers, who were quite familiar with her. After that, I made a point of saying hello to her when I went into the auditorium. She never said anything, but I knew she was always there. That's the first ghost. A friendly theatre goer, happy to keep me company. She was only ever in the auditorium and rarely moved from her seats. The backstage area was okay, always freezing, but okay. It was only the boys' dressing room that gave me the heebie-jeebies. It was the smaller dressing room, 
and we only used it for the boys because we had only three versus the 10 plus girl in the bigger dressing room. I hated being in there alone and would sing even louder when setting up costumes and makeup for rehearsal or using the small cubicle toilet. Even with the door closed, I always felt someone behind me in the hall and I always expected the door to burst open. It never did. And I think that's in part to do with the mirror facing the door. This is an old superstition that mirrors reflecting an entrance will keep a spirit out. I still never spent longer than I needed to in there. The other dressing room was just fine. Just something about the boys. I wonder what it used to be before it was made a dressing room in the new refurb of the back. Whoever haunted that corridor and the stairwell wasn't malevolent, I don't think. I just always expected them to just appear, and I didn't want that to happen when I was alone. Thank you very much. And then, there was the basement. The basement was where the props were kept, and it was underneath the stage, and ran beneath the streets and the auditorium. It was the oldest part of the theatre. The only bit that had never been updated over the 300 years since the theatre was built. It was beyond unwelcoming. What is it about basements? To get down there, I would have to go through a fairly large and heavy trap door in the wings of the stage. I would hook the door on the designated ties to keep it open and then head down to gather the props we needed for rehearsal. And let me tell you, descending beneath the ground was terrifying. The silence, the must, the damp. I never sang because it always echoed unnaturally. It was behind another locked door that I had a key for and the light switch was quite far inside. You'd have to go in a few meters in the dark before you could turn on the light. And it was quite old and blinked as it turned on like a literal horror film. So many times I've been down there and seen shadows whilst the light was warming up. And I always felt like someone was behind me. The basement used to be the dressing rooms back in the Victorian era. So there's lots of different rooms and corridors leading to different rooms. One of the rooms didn't even have a floor, it was just dirt. And I hated that little room. I think everyone did, because no props were ever stored there. I don't know if there was a specific spirit in the basement. It was just all the emotions from all the performances gone by. But I didn't spend more than I needed to down there. But then there was the one time the trap door slammed shut behind me. The slam terrified me so much, I literally screamed for perhaps the fourth time in my whole life. I've always been pretty calm in dramatic situations, but I hated the idea of being trapped down there, even though the trap door didn't lock. It had slammed despite being firmly on the hooks. I dropped the props I was holding literally on the floor and hurried to try it, and thanking all the gods I could open it again. There was no one else in the theatre, and it was about half an hour until the kids started rolling in for rehearsal. But I didn't go down there alone after that. I got the kids to help me bring up the props. I wonder if the spirit who slammed the trap door is the same one who lurked outside the boys' dressing room. They were quite close together. The worst part? I think I know what caused the temper trampum. The ghost light had gone out. Those who have done drama or theatre their whole life will know most of the superstitions that come with the tradition, especially where theatre ghosts are involved. Don't whistle because you may piss them off. Don't be up on the gantry alone in case they like playing tricks. A quick Google will bring them all up, or I may post some more traditions in the comments. Anyway, a ghost light is a light in a theatre that is permanently left on so that the ghosts can feel welcome and won't mess with the performance. In Victorian theatre, it was a literal bare gaslight left in the middle of the stage and was the last thing lit when leaving and locking up after a show. Modern theatres tend to have a green glowing LED somewhere backstage that's not as expensive to run or distracting for the performance. The idea is most theatre ghosts were once performers and a ghost light means they can perform when everyone has left. It's one of the taken for red traditions, like not saying Macbeth. Anyway, the day the trap door slammed shut, I realized after rehearsal finished that the bulb on the ghost light had gone, and I didn't know how to replace it. 
I hightailed it out of there once the kids had left, leaving all the lights on, and teched the theatre manager. I don't feel any more malevolence after it was replaced later that day. Like I said, theatres are superstitious and haunted places. Abigail didn't seem to mind that the light had gone out. This happened a few years ago. I was going through a difficult time, so I was looking for a new place to live without big commitments until I figured life out. I met this guy through a Craigslist posting. He said he had an apartment and was looking for a roommate. I got his name and number, called him, set up a meeting at a public place for a meet and greet. Everything went seemingly fine and he agreed to show me the place. He seemed super nice and helpful. He was easy to get along with. He was neat and low maintenance. It didn't bother me that he was a guy. We agreed on no drugs, no parties, no craziness terms. We agreed on monthly payments and I moved in a few weeks later. So it was after two weeks. One day he comes in early from work and has this very upset voice and claims that we need to talk. He says that I've been acting inappropriately by having my boyfriend stop by on occasion, not even stay or spend the night or anything like that, to see me for like 10 minutes every now and then. I began questioning him and he just said that it made him feel uncomfortable because everyone at the apartment complex thought I was his romantic partner. I was so furious and couldn't believe this bullshit. It then escalated to a point he said that the entire time he had known me, which is like for two weeks of very minimal interaction, plus the fact that I work night shifts, so he was by himself most of the time when he was home. He was convinced that, I believe you are possessed. I can see it in your eyes. I knew at this point the shit had totally hit the fan and that I needed to get as far from this fucker as I could. He acted all calm then, saying that I could take my time looking for a new place and that our arrangement would not work. Yeah, no shit, Felicia. So I told my boyfriend what had happened. I found an apartment I could move into and had planned to do it the very next day. I told the insane roommate. The next day of my moving out comes and I walk into the apartment to get my stuff. There's a wooden cross above my room's door frame with this fucking cliche Jesus Christ on it. Which was pretty offensive since I'm Christian and this lunatic had decided that I'm possessed. I walk into my room and there were these creepy candles all lit. I packed up all my belongings and left. He sent a message to me later with of course something that had to do with God and how I was hoping I would face my sins and darkness. I blocked this fucking creep's number after that. I do trust people a lot less. I would never have a roommate. And this was the first time in my life I had had one. Yeah, for two weeks. Lost I've had at a hotel a while back. Called hotel back pretty quick. And they said there was nothing in the room. Well, I clearly remembered leaving it on the TV stand. Multiple hotel employees went through the room to look for it and didn't find anything. I had figured th that by that point, someone had snatched it already. I called them again a few days later. They told me, again, there was nothing and the room I stayed in was unoccupied by other guests. So I figured it had got to be an employee with room access. Anyway, I had nothing to go on at this point. I marked the iPad lost. Fortunately, I was logged into my iPad through my Apple ID and was able to mark it as lost, meaning whoever got the iPad would see how to get in contact with me. And it would also activate location tracking once connected to Wi-Fi. So a few days ago, my phone vibrates and Find My Phone app notifies me that my iPad is at this particular address, which happens to be two townhomes and it's like five minutes from the hotel. It must have been connected to Wi-Fi only for a few seconds because location was no longer being updated after being turned on for two minutes or so. So I get all excited and contacted the police and gave them the location. They actually went up there and spoke to a few people. But of course, everyone denied having a stolen iPad. Since there were multiple residencies slash units at the given location, 
There was nothing else that could have been done at the time. Okay, fast forward to a month after the iPad was lost. I get a call from this unknown number. This dude is trying to communicate with me and it makes quite some time to get info from him because it was very broken English. Anyway, apparently he got my phone number from the lost screen on the iPad, which locks the iPad out with a message to contact me if the iPad is found. When I asked him how he found it, he said he found it at a car wash a few days ago. Bullshit. I told him I lost it at the hotel and he's like, yeah, yeah, I know where that's at. He asked me where I lived and I told him I was a few hours away, but I'll be on my way to meet him. He then proceeded to say he needed gas money, playing the good Samaritan here, and I said yeah. I asked him if he could meet me another day, but he said he was heading to Florida soon and today works. Mind you, it's like 9pm on a Wednesday night. I said okay, now's fine then, and we agreed to meet at a retail store parking lot. I told him it would take me a bit to get there. He absolutely refused to give me his name or the type of vehicle he was going to be in. One time he called and my husband picked up and he wanted, and he warned him, no dudes. And then he called me another time to say, I'm waiting for you. He then would bring up his wife and you could hear kid noises in the background. Also, when he called me, he addressed me by my full name, which is scary and totally contradicts his statements that he found the iPad at a car wash days prior. I did not mark the iPad lost several hours after I realized it was lost. The reason was that prior to this, I didn't know that marking it lost was a feature that existed. Mind you, I didn't leave my name on the iPad lost screen. The only way he could have known my name was by seeing my iPad Apple ID before I marked it lost. So after the conversation with this guy, my husband and I jumped in the car and drove to the agreed location. We contacted the police on our way there. One of the officers that took my call a few days ago happened to be on duty and knew immediately what I was talking about. We told the cops what the man had planned and said we were very willing to help us. The cops got into the unmarked vehicle and planned to meet this man at the parking lot. They told me to call him and tell him I would be there and give him the description of the unassigned cop car they were using. Last time I called the guy, he told me that the police had stopped him. I hung up. The cops called me 10 or 15 minutes later and said the iPad had been recovered and the man is in custody. Husband and I got to the police station about an hour after this and thanked the officers for returning the iPad. I could not have been more thankful. The officers were incredibly helpful and I was amazed how responsive they were. I called the hotel and the corporate to investigate the matter and all that went very smoothly and they were terrified as to what has occurred. P.S. What did this guy think was going to happen? A woman who doesn't know you is just going to show up at your town, meet you at a retail store parking lot in complete darkness at your request because apparently you have every intent of returning the iPad and it happens to be at night in an isolated area where the woman is completely vulnerable and defenseless? Did he genuinely give any thoughts if it was his wife, sister, daughter? If some guy had lured them into the darkness? with a no dudes condition? How naive was this guy, thinking women are? He just expected me to drive two hours, hand him his $20 cash, his gas money, thank him profusely, have a normal chat in the middle of nowhere and just part ways? Yeah, sounds completely normal to me and completely unsuspicious. And this is just begging the question, are you smarter than a 12 year old and really thought this would transpire the way he thought it would? Imagine if this was someone gullible and just showed up to meet this good Samaritan wannabe in the middle of nowhere late at night. I don't even want to think about the consequences of that. So my mother, E, was in her early 20s and she was travelling from City A to City B by bus for a business conference. Next to her was this young man heading to the same city. For the entire trip, he was telling her how beautiful she was, how he had fallen in love with her, and it really scared E. She attempted to ignore his confessions, but they had to travel together non-stop for five hours in a full bus. Come to find out, they were going to be staying at the same hotel. 
So it's night number one, and this guy somehow found her room and kept banging on her door, pleading her to open, telling her he was crazy about her, he couldn't live without her. She was up all night and scared to death in her room. She apparently had notified the hotel, but they didn't want to do anything about it. By the morning time, things had quietened down and she was getting ready to leave the room. She cracked the door open, soon realizing she couldn't open the door as the door was tied with wires from the outside. She was stuck in the room. She banged on the door for the longest time until the hotel employees heard her, were able to cut the wires and set her free. She bolted out of the room as fast as she could and bought the earliest ticket home. She called the cops and told them to get the hotel and get the guy's info. She never saw him again, thankfully. Not sure what came of this creepy ass guy. There is one Walgreens, downtown in my city, open 24 hours again. I'm impatient and wanted to pick up what I needed tonight instead of trekking out during the day. So I go, do my shopping and head to the car. I'm sitting in the car, it's running, doors are locked and I'm trying to get a podcast to where the story is instead of sitting through the host's bullshit for 45 minutes. Looking at you, my favorite murder. When I first got to the car, my half of the lot was empty. Anyway, get my podcast at the right point, and I hear something pull on my back passenger door. I look up, and there's a young male, with a ball cap on, standard surgical mask, and a backpack. And he's dressed in all black, and all these accessories are black. He was by my back passenger door, and when I looked back, startled to say the very least, he kind of ducked down and peeked into the passenger window holding his hands up as if to apologize. I put the car in reverse and calmly back the car up and reverse into another spot. So now I'm facing the rest of the lot and the spot I was parked in is to my right. Dude is still standing there making apology hands. Then he points to two cars in the lot close to the building and jogs over to them slowly as if to point out, I have a car here, no need to freak out. There was a man and a woman getting out of one car, paying me and this dude no mind as they walked into the store. On their right, there was another vehicle that I couldn't see, and couldn't see if anyone was in it or near it. I just wanted to get the fuck out at this point, so I did, shaking like a friggin' leaf. Here are a few things. First, last month my boyfriend's car was stolen. It was completely my fault. I ran into a gas station for literally a minute leaving the car running, which I've done countless times in my life, and which I'll never do again, in front of the store. I recall a big, newer pickup rolling in front while I was paying, and when I left 12 seconds later, both my boyfriend's car and the pickup were gone. So this kid seemingly pointing to the other vehicle as if to say, I have a car, why would I want yours, is not a comfort. Who knows who was in the other car? It could have been a similar situation where the thief gets dropped off and steals a car and his accomplice follows him out. Second thing, the way the car was parked. If this dude came from that direction, he had to have seen me in the driver's seat. I was sitting up, setting my phone up. So we couldn't even use the excuse of, I didn't know you were there or I was just making sure you were okay. You could see what I was doing and was very conscious. Also, why go to the back passenger side and try the door handle to see if it would open? I wish I'd stuck around. I wish I could have called the cops. I just was not sure this dude didn't have a weapon on him. When I saw him, he just decided to play stupid and walk away instead of actually doing something. I didn't get a good look at him either, especially because he was wearing a hat and a mask and he was bent over so no gorge of his height. I did try calling the store, but no one was answering, even after I tried skipping all the prompts. Especially after getting my boyfriend's car stolen, I'm extra shaken. What if the door was unlocked for some reason? What if the dude had a weapon and tried to use it? What if there were other people around with him, but I got out there before seeing them? What if he was hoping I was asleep or whatever, and was just gonna hide in the back like some horrible urban legend come to life? I'm supposed to be in bed, snuggled with my boyfriend, but instead I'm freaking the fuck out outside, chain smoking. That's another thing, 
I don't smoke in the new car. What have I been outside smoking before heading home? Would he have just pushed past me? Or pushed me in? To put this into context, this story happened a couple months ago, when I was on my way home. Typically, every day of the week, my mom and dad come pick me up at school. Yes, even if I'm 17, lol, and I'm from France, for driving below 18 years old, which is the majority, there is pretty much legal. Sometimes my parents would go on a business trip or vacation, and I would have nobody to pick me up. And I would have to take the bus, which didn't really annoy me that much. I like to play music and think during the ride. Basically, when class ends, I would walk with my friends to a place where all the buses gather, and you can choose which one you take. I think everyone has a bus station in the city they live in, lol. I don't know why that day I chose to do something different, to try a different trajectory from a different bus stop that would take me less time to go home. To have access to that bus stop, I had to go through a narrow street at the end of which you would arrive to the parking lot, an old block of flats, with a lot of little shops beside. You have to know that it's a very commercial and busy place by day, with a lot of traffic. I had my headphones on, so I wasn't really paying attention, but I was walking by the pavements when a foreign blue car went straight towards me. It took me a second to realise what was going on, and I took a step back and went the other way quickly. I didn't really pay attention what just happened, because you know, I thought, a weird guy who drank a little too much for the afternoon apero, as we say in France. So it didn't surprise me so much, I would just change of pavement and pursue my walk. Two minutes had passed, and I started to have a weird feeling, like when someone looks at you or follows you, and I didn't feel so well. I pursued my walk, because I'd almost arrived at the bus stop. Suddenly. I saw a blue car which was running at a walking pace by my side. My heart skipped a beat when I saw it was the same blue car that had practically hit me a few minutes ago. Then the window of the car rolled down, revealing the face of a blue car creep. I didn't really understand. Literally so clueless. He aimed at me, hello. I didn't answer and pursued as if I didn't hear him. I had finally arrived at the bus stop and the creepy guy was gone. You know he's not gone, otherwise I wouldn't be writing this. But I started to feel the exact same feeling I felt earlier when I was walking. I didn't really feel comfortable. Once again, I had that odd feeling of someone looking at me, and I wasn't really reassured, but I told myself it was okay, and it was just an impression. I would love the story to end there, but it wasn't just an impression. When I saw the blue car park right in front of me, I immediately knew I had to go somewhere else, somewhere he could never harm me in public. As I was thinking, I noticed a small bakery with lots of elderly moms with their children, and I thought it would be the perfect hiding place, so I went and pretended to wait in line. I scanned the field of vision to see if he was still there, but I didn't see him. Though, I still had the bad feeling that someone was there. Someone hiding and waiting for me to come out of the bakery. So I keep looking and I saw a big black truck very next to the bus stop. And I thought, he must be hiding behind it, waiting for me. And my instinct didn't betray me. I could see the top of his head protruding from the truck. At this point, I couldn't really escape. If I chose to run, he would pursue me with his car. And I couldn't stay in the bakery forever. So I thought of a plan. I knew that I had a bus at 12.07pm, and it was 12.05pm. I would wait in the bakery until I saw the bus arrive, and I would run to the bus so he wouldn't have the time to get me. That's what I did, and fortunately, I succeeded. I saw him get into his car. That was when I saw his face and body entirely. He looked really skinny. A lot of teeth were missing. I know that because he kept smiling at me with that creepy special face only creeps know the secret of. He hadn't much hair either, and looked very filthy, and whatever he wanted to do with me, didn't reassure me at all. I put my hoodie on and tried to look out the window of the bus, to see if he was still there, but I didn't notice anything. Once again, I would love the story to end there, but no, still not finished with this guy apparently. 
I live near a hospital and have to access it. There is a climb and traffic light just before. The bus I was in had already passed the traffic lights and was at the top of the climb when I saw his car and his gaze at the traffic lights looking at me. I thought to myself, I'm in deep shit. I really had to move my ass and find a good plan so that when I get off the bus he wouldn't see me, follow me and get me. As soon as I got off the bus, I had to run and I did. Hugging the walls of fear that he would see me, I saw his car at the intersection of the bus stop and hid behind a four-wheel drive parked in front of me. I hid there while waiting to see where he was going. Not seeing me, he must have told himself that I was still on the bus and continued to follow the bus. I could see blue car creep pulling away in the distance following the bus. I ran home and when I crossed my gate I stood in front of my front door for more than 10 minutes. I was shocked by what had just happened and I asked myself the famous question of if he had seen me behind the four wheeler what would have happened to me? His strategy was actually to follow the bus and watch everyone who got off in the hopes that I was one of the people so then he would block me with his car and get me. This episode really scared the shit out of me and now each time I walk by this bus stop area I got chills down my spine. I always have the fear that the guy would reappear. I think I'm clearly traumatised by blue cars from now on. Every time I see one I just can't help but blench and stress.